do another installment of this I have no idea what I'm doing project. Anyway, Prince Shotoku, often referred to in this story as just the Prince. Part 2. So the Prince has just gotten done kicking the crap out of the anti-Buddhist brigade. And so, not long after that, the Prince's uncle ascends the throne as Emperor Sushu. And being this kid's uncle, this kid? Being this guy's uncle, and knowing that all the stories about how he's like supernatural, the Emperor turns most of the affairs of state over into the hands of the prince. So the prince, even though he's not technically the emperor, he's the one who's actually in charge of everything. This is actually a pattern you will see throughout Japanese history in general. You have the person who's in charge on paper, and then you have the one who's actually in charge. In this case, Prince Shotoku, the prince, is the one in charge. And then, guess what happens? Another monk from Pekche shows up. Another one, because we can't have enough of those. Just kidding, it's not a monk. Guess what we have? Another visitor from Pekche. At least this time it's not a monk. This time it's a prince. It's a prince. Prince Asa. But anyways, Prince Asa might as well be a monk, because what he does is he comes to, the, to Prince Shotoku in a manner resembling, like, great honor, and hails the prince and says, in classical Japanese, something to the effect of, Honor and thanks be Kanon, the savior of the world. His marvelous teachings are spread to the east and the country of the sun. Thou shalt surely expound the Dharma and enlighten this land until thou hast reached 49 years of age. And then, of course, after this, the prince does another one of those holy Kamehamehas from between the eyebrows Buddhist thing. Because, I mean, doesn't everybody need a, a holy Kamehameha from between your eyes every once in a while? Doesn't everybody do that? And then, again, not long after this, the prince was given a gift of a black horse from the province of Kai, which is way, way, way in the east at this point. You may know Kai from Takeda Shingen, for those of you who are familiar with Japanese history. But they're, I guess they're famous from horses, and the prince actually gets one of these horses. It's a black horse, pitch black, but all four of his legs are actually white colored, so I guess he's a cool looking horse. But anyway, so the prince receives this horse, jumps on his back, you know, rides, mounts him. And then, as the horse starts galloping off, they fly up into the air. They're just flying, galloping, in the air. This is something that happens in these legends a lot. And not just flying off in the air, but he starts flying out eastward. Like, he just poof, just takes off, straight east, to the middle of nowhere. And then, one of the prince's servants, a guy named Skaimaru, which literally just means servant dude, something to that effect, he starts flying with them for no reason. He just, boom, they're just gone, gone, flying, Peter Pan style. Off to Neverland, second start of the right, straight on till morning, actually, because they are going east, so they kind of are going towards the morning. I mean, you didn't know Peter Pan was actually from Japan. Anyway, so they're just flying, and they fly so far east, they fly all the way out to a place called Mino, and they circumvented the three outer provinces of Echizen, Echu, and Echigo, which which is basically the end of the territory of, of the Japanese imperial, the Japanese empire at the time. So he flies around there and he comes back and after three days of being on he finally shows back up and now he's no longer riding his flying horse. But he has a flying horse now so that's great. And then some more time passes and Emperor Sushun, the prince's uncle, abdicates or maybe he dies, I don't know, he's not the emperor anymore. But then his aunt, the Empress Suiko, and she's an empress mind you, she's not an emperor, but she becomes empress and she takes even more responsibilities and hands them off to the prince. So the prince is now, I mean, he was basically a strong man before. He was very powerful. But now he is like the guy. He's in charge. Again, not on paper, technically. But in actuality, he's the one who's actually running the show of the whole country. Okay? But anyways, with these newfound powers, the prince decides that, you know, I do really like this whole Buddhist stuff. So I'm going to do a bunch of Buddhist stuff. So one day, the prince puts on some Buddhist monk robes, takes in his hand a brush of white horse hair, which is this little little thing that they have in East Asian Buddhism. It's just kind of like a symbol thing of like a scepter kind of a thing. I don't know the, the symbolic significance of it. If somebody else knows, they can explain down in the comments. Let us all know. And then he takes up a high seat and he starts expounding the Srimala Devi Simhanada. That sutra. But anyway, there's a lot of monks there, a lot of other Buddhist monks there, and they're all just like aghast with how knowledgeable the prince is, because of course they are. 
They always are. You'd think they would stop being surprised by this at this point, but apparently they're all just like, Oh my gosh, who knew? Who knew this guy knew so much? We didn't even know. But he's preaching for three nights. I'm noticing a pattern here. He was gone for three nights. He's preaching for three nights. But anyways, three nights, three days of preaching. And on the third and final day, a bunch of lotus flowers start falling from the sky. It starts raining lotus flowers. And each of these lotus flowers are three feet wide. Three feet, three feet. Three feet? Three feet? I don't know. Three feet wide, and so many of them fall that there's about four inches thick of just lotus flowers on the ground. Four inches thick. Lots of flowers, basically. And then when the Empress heard about this, she was also like, oh my, this is crazy. This is awesome. So she commanded that a temple should be built in honor of this celestial, miraculous event, and it is known as the Tachibana Temple. And at least when the story was originally written, it was actually still standing. I don't know if it is anymore. It might be. And then these lotus blossoms that supposedly fell from the sky and carpeted the floor in four inches thick were being housed in that temple. So there you go. Now this next little bit is actually very interesting because in a sense a lot of this actually happened and this was one of the things that Prince Shotoku is actually very famous for. So the prince had with him a retainer, a servant, whoever, uh, a guy by the name of Onono Imoko. There's a lot of O's in his name. Prince one day came to Onono Imoko and told him, he's like, Hey, many, many, many years ago, I, in another life, lived in China on Hengshan Mountain in the southern part of Hongshan. Again, I don't actually speak Chinese, so I'm probably butchering those names. Again, feel free to correct me. But anyways, he's, he's telling Onono Imoko, Yeah, I used to live in China. I used to be here. And by now... Most of my fellow priests, Buddhist priests, have probably died. However, there are still over there three of them living. So what I want you to do, Mr. Imoko, I want you to go to China, go back to where I used to live, go find my Buddhist bros, the three Buddhist bros, and I want you to get a hold of my old copy of the Lotus Sutra and bring it back to me. Now again, this is very interesting because Shotoku Taishi did, in fact, send Onono Imoko to China I think even multiple times. Now, according to the history that I understand, it wasn't necessarily to get Buddhist sutras, but a lot of it also had to do with trying to open up some sort of official trade partnership or some sort of intercourse, get your heads out of the gutter, with China, you know, so they could take in all of this fancy high culture, get artisans, get sutras, but get other texts on like government organization and all of the cool stuff that China had. So, we do know for a fact that Onono Imoko did in fact go to China, again on multiple times. In fact, there is a famous letter that the prince sent with Onono Imoko where the prince basically said to the emperor of China something to the effect of the king of the sunrise country greets the king of the sunset country, which actually the Chinese didn't really like because it placed Japan, this kind of like backwards, you know, country of nobodies and didn't do anything cool. This teeny tiny country, it placed them on par with them, which pff, obviously they were the best. I mean, they were the middle kingdom, like, but you know, and at the time they kind of were, they were kind of a big deal on the block. They were the big boys on the block, you know, they still kind of are. We won't get into that. But anyway, in, as far as this story goes, the prince commanded Onono Imoko to go to this place in China to get his Lotus Sutra. So, that's what Onono Imoko did. Got on a boat, sailed to China, went to where the prince said, and found this mountain where he used to be a practicing Buddhist priest in China. So he goes up to their gate, and there's a gatekeeper there. And, you know, the gatekeeper asks, who are you, what do you want here? And Onono Imoko says, well, I'm from Japan. I come for the copy of the Lotus Sutra of my prince, Prince Shotoku, and I guess he gave some sort of an explanation of what was going on. And the gatekeeper shouts through the gate, a servant of the priest Shizen is come. And so the gate opens and out hobble three old monks all leaning on canes. But they're absolutely ecstatic to hear this. They are so overjoyed to see this man who is the messenger of somebody that they revered and they love very dearly. So after instructing Onono Imoko with some Buddhist wisdom because, you know, you can't not visit three old Buddhist priests and not gain some sort of wisdom. You know, not sit in on a lecture or two, come on. But they gave him the Lotus Sutra and Onono Imoko brought it back and handed it to Prince Shotoku and awesome, mission accomplished. Except, not quite. So, the prince builds a big hall next to his palace, his Ikaruga palace, his palace in Ikaruga, and he calls it the Yume Dono, which means something to the effect of the Hall of Dreams. And every so often, the prince would cleanse himself, put on some nice robes, some nice fancy robes, make sure he's clean, and purify himself, and he would go into this Hall of Dreams, and he would shut everything, and he would have no contact with the outside world. 
for a whole day, all day and all night, no contact with anybody. And the next morning, he would emerge, and he would have all sorts of fancy annotations on the sutras, and all of his meditations on, on expounding Buddhist truths, and all that good stuff. One day, the prince went in, closed the doors, everything, you know, this is normal, oh, the prince just kind of does this. He goes in, and he doesn't come out for seven whole days. Seven days. No word. Nobody knows what's going on. Nothing. So a bunch of people start getting worried, as, you know, is only natural. Like, this guy is the, basically the leader of Japan. Again, that's why he felt like he could write a letter to China saying, putting himself on par with them, because he's kind of a big deal around these parts, right? But anyway, so people are starting to get worried. Well, should we go in? Like, what do we do? But, as you can guess, a priest from Korea, again, it doesn't exactly say where in Korea, but a priest from Korea named Eji, just kind of turns to everybody and says, hey guys, chill, it's fine. It's the prince we're talking about, okay? What he's doing right now is he's in a very deep state of samadhi. And in case you don't know, and honestly, I don't really know either. I'm no expert in Buddhist theology. But samadhi is basically a very deep state of concentration that you get in meditation. If you're really, really good at it, you can enter it where, uh, you know, it's a deep state of concentration. We'll just leave it at that. If you really want to know, go watch some Alan Watts or something. Or look up some Bhikkhu Bodhi, some venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi videos. Like, it's, you can learn a lot. Trust me, Buddhism is really cool. There's a lot of fun stuff there to find. But I'm not even going to try to explain some of this stuff. It's it's beyond my pay grade. Cause I'm not even getting paid. So there. But anyway, on the eighth day, the prince finally emerges. Boom. Comes out and everyone's relieved. Obviously, like, <sighs> we don't know if he was dead. I don't know if he killed himself. Like, we had no idea what was happening. But... Everybody notices, as he's coming out, that there is a brand new Sutra Scroll chilling on his jeweled desk. Of course he has a jeweled desk. He's the leader of Japan. Why would you not have a jeweled desk? And when everybody's looking at this scroll and being like, yo, where'd this come from? The prince basically just says, so, the Sutra Scroll that Onono Imoko brought back to me from China wasn't actually my scroll. It was just a copy of my scroll. My esteemed Buddhist brethren in China didn't actually know where my scroll was, but they couldn't very well send Imoko home, oh no no Imoko home with nothing. So they did the next best thing and gave him one of their scrolls. But I've been spending the past week or so in the Hall of Dreams, sending my spirit out over to China so I could go and pick up my actual scroll. So everyone is just like stunned, like, what? But again, I mean, he rode a horse all the way across the country through the sky. He can shoot holy Kamehameha's out of his forehead, like, are you really that surprised? But anyway, everyone decided that they wanted to compare the two sutras, which they do. They found that the new one that the prince had was word for word, just like the one that Ono no Imoko brought back, except it had more stuff in it. it, had more expounding on it. Plus, both the paper and the axle of this new sutra were coated in gold. Because again, got to have that Buddhist bling. And then, of course, we have, this time, not just one monk from Korea, but a whole group of monks called Dokon, which means basically something to the effect of those who rejoice in the path. Again, that's my own personal translation. Could be wrong. Then the prince, of course, has to go see them because it's a bunch of Buddhist monks from outside Japan. So he's got to go talk to them. So he's talking to them. And one of them actually looks to the prince and says, you know, Mr. Shoto Taishi, sir, in your past life on Mount Hengshan, we would actually come to you very often in your sainted mountain, and we listen to your discourses on the Lotus Sutra a lot. Thanks for that. Moving on. So another time, Onono Imoko goes back to China. Again, he was sent multiple times to try to foster some kind of a relation, official relationship with China. And he goes to Mount Hengshan, and he goes and visits the old Buddhist monks that were the prince's friends back in the day. And now only one of them still left alive. Two of the three have died, and only one of them still hanging out, and he's barely hanging on. But he tells him, you know, sometime around last fall, that prince of your country came riding over here through the sky in a carriage being pulled by a blue dragon and had 500 servants who all stepped around and danced in the air like they were magic. And as soon as he landed here in our mountain, he instantly went to his old room, grabbed his old scroll, and then he just booked it without saying a single word to us. And Iwako, of course, hearing this, started asking when specifically this started happening. And to the best of his knowledge, it happened during those eight days when the prince was inside his hall of dreams, doing his really big, deep meditation, and did exactly what he said he did. So we've got corroborations from both sides, both in Japan and China. Oh, what do you know? And then one day, the prince, you know, he's all this crazy stuff has been happening, so we need to see a moment where the prince is just kind of big chilling, and that's exactly what he does. Except he can't just big chill, because he's the prince. But anyway, he's hanging out with his princess, 
of the noble Kashiwade clan. Again, I don't know what her name is. The story doesn't really mention it. But they're just hanging out, probably being lovey-dovey. Who knows what they're doing? Again, please don't make this dirty. I'm begging you. But he suddenly turns to her and says, You know, my dear, my darling, many, many years you've been so faithful. You have done everything I've ever asked you to do. You have helped me with everything. And you've never made even a single mistake. After I pass on, I want you to share my grave with me. Which kind of sounds really macabre, but you know, it's also a little bit cute. Isn't it? Isn't it? Like, I hope I hope we can be buried together. Aw, isn't that? That's adorable. But the princess was kind of taken aback because was well, suddenly talking about death. And she says to him essentially the same thing. She says, you know, I've only ever thought about what I can do to make your life better. That's all I've ever thought about. Why are you suddenly bringing up this talk about death? And the prince, you know, being the dignified prince that he is, but also the artistic and the uh, sensitive and very Buddhist prince that he is, says something to the effect of, all that has a beginning has an end. Everything that lives is fated to die. This is the nature of Buddhism. In fact, if you look at, again, the prince didn't say this, but one of the core concepts of Buddhism is that everything is transient. Everything is fleeting. Nothing lasts. Nothing sticks around. Ever. This is one of the core, core principles of Buddhism. But anyway, the prince continues on, saying, For a long, long time, many, many lives, many ages I've lived, and I have studied the path of the Buddha, and I have sought to expand the teachings to everybody. Thus... I was born a prince of this very tiny country, and I have done my best to spread the teachings everywhere. And my task now is all but finished, and I don't think I have much longer to be here. And the princess, obviously, she couldn't really say anything to this, because what do you say to that? And especially with his supernatural gifts, like, it's not like he's making this up. If he says he's probably going to die, he's probably going to die. But anyway, so all she can really do is she just sits there crying, and then probably hugs her, and... Yeah, okay. And then another instance, and this is a story that the prince is actually very famous for. So the prince one day is riding his legendary flying black horse, only this time they're not flying, but he's he's riding his black horse from a place called Naniwa, and on the way, he's passing by this place is called Kataokoyama, and he suddenly sees, on the side of the road, a starving traveler. He stops his horse, he hops down off, and starts talking to this guy. He takes off a purple robe that he himself was wearing. And mind you, purple is, as you probably have noticed, purple is actually a very fancy color. It's hard to make purple. But he takes off a purple robe and he lays it on the back of this stranger. And then, being filled with Buddhist compassion, he speaks a poem. Now, I'm not going to get to the ins and outs of Japanese poetry. I love Japanese poetry. Part of the reason why I decided to start learning old Japanese is so that I could read old Japanese poetry. By the way, these are old Japanese stories. But anyway... Effectively, what I translated this poem to is something like, Here in Okoyama, a poor wayfaring man has collapsed from hunger with not even his parents to pity him. <laughs> but, you know, coming coming on the heels of telling his wife that he's going to die soon and that she just needs to make peace with the fact that he's going to die. And now he's basically just saying, Yeah, man, you're starving, bro. You're going to die. <laughs> oh. Take what you will from that. Anyway. After the traveler heard this stirring poem, he himself raises his head weakly, like he's starving, and says something to the effect of, Even after the waters of the great river Tomio have dried up, yet I will not forget thee, my lord. Stirring, right? Anyway, after this little poetry contest, poetry exchange, the prince, he has to go home. Like, he was on his way home. He, he can't sit around and hang out with this guy forever. So he immediately goes back, and as soon as he gets home, Somebody, some other messenger, I guess somebody was bringing up the rear or maybe stayed a little bit while longer and was hanging out. But somebody comes up and tells the prince, hey, that guy that you gave the robe to. And now the cynic in me is wondering, <laughs> did he actually die? Or did somebody see that fancy robe that was probably really expensive and was just like, well, nobody's going to know. Probably like conked him over the head with a rock or something and then just took the robe. and was, Oh, my prince, I'm so sorry. He didn't make it, sir. Is that what happened? I mean, I'm just being a cynic. Don't listen to me. Or please listen to me. But anyway, the prince hears about this guy dying, and he feels really bad, and he sends some people out to go give the man a proper burial, like an actual proper burial. And of course, news about this spreads. Like, oh my gosh, did you see what the prince did? Like, some people were probably like, oh, he deigned to hang out with the 
peasantry, especially the starving, stinky, dying ones? <laughs> Do you see the... He gave that cloak to him? Do you know how much money that's worth? Oh. Some people were probably overwhelmed by his compassion, thinking he's just absolutely the best. And he took the clothes off of his own back to help a guy, but also reminded him that he was going to die. Because, you know, that's just what we do in Buddha land. But news spread, and some people started talking smack about the prince. Some people in the capital, some of the rich cats, right? And they didn't believe that this had happened. Like, why would the prince, why would the prince stop and talk to him? nobody? Pfft. No, this is a lie. And even then, that's stupid. Why would you do that? Why would you give such a f such rich clothing to some nobody who's probably going to die anyway? He's going to die anyway. What a waste. <sighs> stupid prince. But anyway, the prince hears them talking smack, and he turns around and says to him, he's like, you know what? If you don't believe anything I said, you want to go see for yourself? Go to Kataokayama. Kataokayama. Sorry. Bad American pronunciation. Kataokayama. And go see for yourself. Which they did. They were happy to. But again, I don't know what the time frame of all of this was. Apparently some time had passed. Because these guys go to Kataokayama. They find the burial place, the tomb. And they dig it up. And they open the coffin. There's nothing inside. It's completely empty. The only thing that they do notice is that there's a very, very sweet fragrance wafting out of this coffin. You know, the kind of smell that attends something supernatural. And of course... They were shocked, and immediately shut up. That's what you get. So who has the last laugh? So finally, one day, the prince, 49 years old, big chillin', and he comes to his princess and he says, Remember the other day when I was telling you about my time? It's time. And so, he goes in, he washes himself down, puts on some nice, clean robes, and he takes his princess into his arms, and they lay down in their bed chamber, bed area, Kind of hard to explain. But they lay down together, and they fall asleep. And in the morning, some people show up, and they have both passed on. They are both, both of them are dead. And what everybody was surprised is they probably had been dead for a while. They were just as youthful and brilliant and radiant as when they were alive. And now there was a sweet, incense-like fragrance all over the room. And again, the prince at this time was a mere 49 years of age. And after this happened, immediately after that morning, the prince's horse, that magical flying black steed, started freaking out, started whinnying and neighing all over the place. And he started refusing all food, all water, and just kind of depressed and eventually died himself. And then, also a little weird, the prince's fancy lotus sutra scroll that he had magically sent his spirit out to China to go grab and bring back, it was missing, disappeared, poof, just gone. And everybody insists that the prince's soul took that with him to the next life. You know, we don't want to have a repeat where he has to spend eight days meditating in a fancy hall and sending his spirit over the ocean and into another continent so he can pick it up. He's just going to take it with him this time. And then, of course, the prince and his wife were buried together. And then all we basically have is the legacy of the prince. So the statue of Shakan Yodai that he named that came from the Korean kingdom of Shila. When this story was written, it was in Kofukuji. The statue of Maitreya, the statue of Miroku, Buddha from the Korean kingdom of Pekche, is at was at the time in Genkoji in the old capital of, I'm assuming, Asuka at this time? It just says the old capital in the story. Um, the prince, again, made a bunch of annotations on the Lotus Sutra, and all of those are, at least when this story was written, could be found in... Ikaruga, the Ikaruga Palace, which is where the prince lived. And so can a lot of the tools and things that the prince had. And they say that they are still as bright and as sharp as the day that the prince used them. Now, the prince, I call him the prince, and I call him Shotoku Taishi. That's the most common name by which he's known. But the story does point out that he was known by four different names, four different titles. The first one was the Stable Prince. And the reason why he was known as the Stable Prince was because his mom gave birth to him when she was passing by the horse stables. The second one is the Eight-Eared Prince. Because apparently he had this uncanny ability of being able to hear every single word that you would speak, even when you were in a room full of other people. Like, he had exceptionally good hearing. I don't know why eight ears, but he has eight ears. And then the name that he's most commonly known by, Shotoku Taishi, means something like the Prince of Holy Virtue. Because he dedicated his life to spreading the teachings of Buddhism all over the country. And the, the last name that the prince was known by 
was the grand ruling prince, or that's what I translated it to. I don't know how accurate that translation is. The grand ruling prince, because, like I said, he was actually basically the one in charge of everything. Specifically, most notably, after the Empress Suiko came into power, she just basically took all of her responsibilities and handed them to him. And he was the one in charge. And again, that's why I would argue he's actually one of, if not the single most important person's people. People? He's one of the most important people, if not the most important person in all of Japan's history. Because he kind of was one of the most important founding figures of early Japan. He brought over a lot of Chinese culture. He actually implemented the first, what some people might call, constitution of Japan. It was a 17, it had 17 points, and they were largely based on Confucian ideas, but with some Buddhist stuff thrown in there too. But he was trying really, really hard to make Japan a full-on respectable society in the eyes of China. Borrowed a lot of these, these, a lot of these philosophical and governmental ideas from China and tried to make Japan into an actual full-on prosperous, mighty kingdom. And so because of that, he introduced Buddhism, he helped introduce Confucianism, he set up the court rank system that was changed somewhat, but still continued for centuries, actually. He was actually on, I believe, ten, the 10,000 yen dollar bill. The 10,000 yen bill? <laughs> 10,000 dollar bill. The 10,000 yen bill, but apparently they switched him out with some other modern guy who I don't think is nearly as cool. But he is one of the most important, if not the single most important person in Japan's history, and I would argue he's more important than a lot of these people, because without him, Japan doesn't exist as we understand it. But anyways, one of the things that you're going to notice about these stories is they, they, they have an opening, something similar to Once Upon a Time, but they all end the same way. They end with the phrase, Katari, katari tsutai taruto ya, which means something to the effect of, thus is it said, thus it has been said, or something like that. So, the little ending snippet here in this story is something to the effect of, in the land of Japan, Buddhism began spreading because of the efforts of Shotoku Taishi, of the prince, the holy prince of virtue. Were it not for him, who would even know of the phrase Buddhism at all in Japan? Thus, it is said that those who possess the faculties of mind and heart will surely praise the prince. <sighs> okay, so that's going to be it for Prince Shotoku. This one is a little bit meandering because this story largely involves just snippets of little bits of legends that they all just kind of mash together. The prince's life can largely be found in... The Nihon Shoki, which is an old, old Japanese history from over 1,500 years ago, or about 1,500 years ago, something like that. Or maybe not quite 1,500 years ago. But anyway, you can look him up yourself. He's a fascinating figure. Again, arguably one of the most important people in Japanese history. But that's all they have in the Konjaku Monogatari Shu, which is what I'm actually pulling from. It's a collection of old Japanese stories. And yeah, that's all they have in here. And I appreciate you for coming out and listening to me ramble on about stuff that I think is kind of fascinating. But, you know, I'm just doing my thing. Anyway, I would be much obliged if you could send any and all support my way. Like, subscribe. Hopefully my channel grows and we can make things nicer and better. And I'll get better at telling stories. So, appreciate any support you can offer. But for now, I'm going to call it there. Thanks and bye.